Welcome. I'm Dr. Vinay Prasad. I'm a hematologist oncologist, and I'm associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. In my professional life, I see patients, I teach trainees, and I do research in healthcare policy. This is Plenary Session. Plenary Session is a podcast at the intersection of medicine, oncology, and health policy, and you're listening to season three. On this week's episode. This week on Plenary Session, I'm back joined by Ade Adamson and Ben Mazur. They're the authors of a new New England Journal paper about melanoma, and you won't want to miss this discussion. If you like this podcast and want more content, follow me on Twitter at vprasadmdmph. Check out the YouTube channel, Vinay Prasad MDMPH. Patreon backers will get access to the slides for lectures I give on Plenary Session. Want to hear from us? Email us your question at plenarysessionpodcast at gmail.com. I'm back in Plenary Session HQ, joined via Zoom by two all-stars of, of Twitter and academic medicine and, and, and beyond. Um, I'm joined by uh, Dr. Ade Adamson. Uh, Dr. Adamson is an assistant professor at the Dell Medical School in Austin, Texas. He's a practicing dermatologist. I'm joined by friend of the show, Ben Mazur. You know him well. He describes himself as a surgical pathology, um, what was it, assistant? Um, what did you yeah. call yourself? But he really is a... a, a I'll say quasi faculty member. I'm going to call him a quasi faculty member because you, you should be faculty. That's what member. I am. That's what you are. That's what you yeah. are. Okay, it's a pleasure to have you both. A day. It's very nice to meet you. This is the first time I get to I get to see you as this postage stamp on my on my screen. Yeah, I appreciate it. You know, I've been following you for for many years on Twitter, so it's nice to see you live. Uh, it's <laughs> live and in person. Yeah, I, I, when people tell me that, I always feel compelled to apologize. I'm I'm sorry if anything uh, for anything I've, I've said or done. Um, okay, gentlemen. Um, well, where should we get started? There's so much to talk about, um, but I think uh, let, let's just start by the, your paper. Now, now you both teamed up um, with Gil Welch, and um, uh, you have a new paper out in the New England Journal of Medicine, and I just, I just gave it a good read, and I, I was blown away. I mean, this is really a really clever paper. This is about melanoma. And um, this is a paper that's that's not going to earn you many friends. Um, and I guess I guess um, I don't know. Maybe I'll I'll take a crack at summarizing, and then I'm going to let you guys tell me all the things I, I said wrong, um, because that's that's a good learning exercise for me. Okay, here's how I would summarize it. I was like, the first thing you 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 all observe is that the incidence of me- of, of melanoma is going up really really fast. It's gone up. It's gone up sixfold over the last 30, 40, 50 years. The, the, the death rate, uh, adjusted age-adjusted death rate of melanoma is sort of a flat line, hasn't changed at all until Ipinevo 2015, then it went down just a, just a smidge. It's come down just a smidge. But the incidence has exploded, six-fold increase. And you say, what can explain this six-fold increase? Why do we have so much more melanoma? And, of course, the popular answer is that people – are sunbathing too much. You're out in the sun too damn much. And you make the excellent point that if you pool all the studies on tanning beds, um, you'll find that maybe tanning beds increase the risk like odds ratio 1.2. And sun exposure, maybe it's 2. Um, and so you say that imagine we have the worst case scenario when everyone is getting you know sunburned all the time. Well, that would still only explain like one third of the rise of metastatic melanoma. You got two thirds unexplained. That's the worst case scenario. And um, you use this lovely example of cigarette smoking where you show that the odds ratio of cigarette smoking, if you assume 50% of people smoked who didn't previously smoke, it actually explains the entire rise uh, of cigarette smoking. So that really kind of lends credence to this idea. And so then you take a deeper dive in trying to argue why you believe that it is not an exogenous um, factor that has led to the increase in melanoma, it's got to be something else. And that something else is sort of a a, a multi-pronged strategy of we're looking for it much more. We're doing skin exams on people looking for it. We've got some microscope or magnifying glass that zooms in real close. And then this component that Ben adds, I think the pathology component, which is that the same specimen under the microscope would previously be called benign nevi. Now that's melanoma. And when you put all that together, you've got the overdiagnosis sauce that really explains the rise of this entity. Um, okay, that's what I garnered from your from your essay. But maybe we'll start we'll start with you. Um, we'll start with you a day. Um, how did you? Um, How'd you come into this? And, and, you know, what am I saying wrong? What am I saying right? I think that was a good summary of um, 
of how all of this came about. And yeah, it started exactly with what you what you described, looking at the incidence and mortality curves over the last 40 years uh, using SEER data. Um, and there's this huge disconnect with the rising incidence in basically flat mortality, which is, you know, pathognomonic for mm -hmm. uh, overdiagnosis. And this is something that became more clear to me when I was um, a medical, well, a dermatology resident, um, reading, you know, work in this space by uh, by Bob Swirlick, by Gil Welsh, and and others, um, and I wanted to write about it, so I actually reached out to, to Gil, um, and he responded, um, he and yeah, yeah, and we decided to, you know, write something together uh, in this space. This isn't um, this isn't and, the first time you collaborated. You guys have worked on some other papers, isn't that right? Yeah, 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 we okay. uh, we had a paper in the New England Journal like in 2019 looking uh -huh. at artificial intelligence and um, right. and the and the gold standard problem of uh, pathologic right. diagnosis. Uh -huh. um, but that uh, that paper and that idea actually started, you know, a year or two into me and Gil's relationship uh, um, in terms of looking at melanoma mm -hmm. and sun exposure, et cetera, what you're seeing in this latest mm -hmm. paper. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually joked with him. I was like, yeah, you know, we've had this paper rejected all these journals. Um, I'm telling you this, this artificial intelligence paper will get out first. And, and it did, you know, much to my shock a year before this uh, recent New England Journal paper. Um, so yeah, we had a lot of pushback. We had a lot of pushback for the first half of the paper, which had to do with uh, looking at sun exposure and melanoma. Uh huh. Go on. Yeah, let's let's talk about that a little bit before we bring before we get to the part of the story where Ben makes his cameo. Yeah, yeah. Um, we had to, yeah, we so, had to bring in Ben. You had to bring in Ben. Uh, I see. Yeah. You were met. You met with the reviewer too, the dreaded reviewer too. This is a this is a humorless. Uh, soulless creature that exists uh, in in the world of academic medicine that um, doesn't understand their real role in in refereeing um, provocative thought pieces. They believe it has to reflect what they believe rather than it has to be a meritorious or or fairly strong argument on the face of it. Uh, but anyway, I'm wondering if you could tell me what were the what were the kind of objections you would get, um, and what were the the sort of what was the resistance? Where was the friction point? So there was a lot of um, friction related to us challenging gospel mm -hmm. that the reason why we have all this melanoma is because people are sunbathing mm -hmm. and people are getting sunburned. Um, and that our message was a threat to the public health. Like that oh was boy. written in, oh boy, that was written in to the public in, health. <laughs> yeah. Review, I don't know, review or two or three, one mm -hmm. of those reviewers. Uh, and that's actually uh, my Twitter bio threat to the public health. That's what. <laughs> 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 wow. You know? Which, I mean, if you don't mind, I just want to say one thing real quick. I mean, I think it, it, it's very interesting, and this is something that I know you probably have seen me complain about before, which is that, um, you know, when it comes to medicine, everything we do to some degree, you can make the case that it plausibly impacts how long people live or how well they live. And there's always going to be some people who disagree that some things are beneficial or harmful. And so somebody can always say that somebody's view is a threat to people's health. I mean, it's sort of an empty thing to say, but it, it sounds like you're really bad. You're a really bad person and you have ill intent and you want bad things to happen to people, which of course is not true. You want good things to happen to people. You just disagree what the good and how do you get there and I also want to be very honest about um, levels of risk you know too often you see you know particularly from my field where we make this um, kind of uh, um, um, parallel that smoking is related to lung, lung cancer as strongly as sun exposure is to melanoma, which is absurd it's a, it's preposterous you know it's overstating um, it's overstating the case. It, it is. It is. Um, and I think that is, you know, equally as damaging and misleading. That's so well said. Um, I mean, I, I don't know what to say other than I just wholeheartedly agree with you that one of the roles of science and medicine communication is to state something's a risk, but you don't have to overindulge it and embellish it. But uh, that's it's been a tough year for that in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> it's been been a tough year for risk communication. Okay, so 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 that was the that was the crux of the disagreement. Um, but you had had the yeah. first parts of the argument there. You saw the incidents, you saw the mortality, you saw that UV radiation cannot explain it. Um, but you right. didn't have sort of the alternative. You didn't have the sort of pieces in place for the alternative explanation. So that's where Ben comes in. 
Right. And so, uh, and uh, this is where I, I credit, you know, Gil has been an amazing mentor to me um, saying, you know what, let's pull back. Hmm. There seems to be a bit of resistance in the, you know, and we need to bring in reinforcements. We I need see. to enlarge this story and, you know, give a reason as to an alternative explanation um, to what we, you know, believe. And, you know, in the sun exposure papers, we were saying like, you know, diagnostic scrutiny, that's the problem. That's the problem. We weren't proving it. Right. 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 And so uh, we're like, you know, we need a really, really smart dermatopathologist I mean, or pathologist, mm-hmm. excuse me. Um, and uh, I was like, I, I know this guy on Twitter uh, named Ben Mazur. Uh-huh. Um, and actually, I think Ben and Gil had done a yes. uh, letter to the editor before. Yes. Yeah. And I was like, how about Ben? Let's uh, <laughs> let's call him up. So then Ben. So Often that, you have yeah. the uh, you have the benefit of being the only pathologist that anyone knows. Uh-huh. That's really the niche you have to fill. It's like everyone either knows zero or one pathologist. And so so they were looking for the best the pathologist. pathologist. They look in the Rolodex. There's one card there. It's Ben Mazur. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but of course, you're an a, a, a incredibly thoughtful person. And I was just reading your Wired article, and I thought that was spectacular, too. So, of course, they come to you, Ben. And, and what do you think when they tell you this, this problem? What's, what's running through your mind? Well, you know, this is an issue that pathologists have been talking about for a long time. Um, you know, it's fu- I mean, people say, oh, you know, I'm not a dermatopathologist, so I must not know what I'm talking about. Uh, but pathologists gossip, you know, um, and I am involved in health policy related to, to pathology um, and specifically, you know, economic policy. And this has long been known that self-referring in pathology increases volume. Mm. I, uh, I didn't mention that, volume. but why don't you tell people what that means? That was one of the arguments in the essay, um, that self-referring changes the game. So what does self-referring mean, and, 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 what, and how does it change the game? Yeah, it's sort of a – so, okay. So uh, in general, in medicine in America, it is not legal to self-refer. Mm, to, stark violation. Right. There's this something called the Stark Law, which says that uh, – that, you can't refer to a specialty service for which you stand to financially gain. You own a, you own some kind of a stake in that because obvi- as you can imagine, that's a natural conflict of interest that it would encourage you to send more lab testing, send more imaging, send more whatever specialty care. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, there are exceptions in the law or, mm-hmm. you know, I'll just call them loopholes, uh, which is the per- derogatory term. You know, one of them is, anatomic pathology, which mm-hmm. means biopsies. Yes. Um, I'm not familiar with all the details of why that was stuck in. I mean, I guess people thought it was fair and more convenient, but uh, it's been exploited by three main specialties, dermatology, urology with prostate and bladder biopsies, mm. and gastroenterology with colon polyps. Mm. All of those are heavy biopsy services. I mean, appropriately heavy. It is a you, you know, gotta there's a lot of volume you that you look. need to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But then there's also a flexibility in how you biopsy because the threshold at which you biopsy differs by person and there's no 100% objective standard that everyone would agree on. And of course, most people will not blame you if you're being extra careful and biopsy more because that's being a good doctor, right? You're being extra careful. Right. And so there's this ins- – there's – it's very easy to increase your biopsy volume in a in a defensible way. Right. And so now if you own a stake in the pathology lab, right. then uh, and you get paid extra on top of those biopsies, it's just a natural incentive. And the Government Accountability Office uh, studied this a number of years ago, uh, and they had the best data available, having accessed all the Medicare data. And they found that labs that that Doc specialists who open their own labs, pathology labs, uh, increase their biopsy volume quite a bit. That was really the best way you could study this because it wasn't, there's no like randomized control trial for this. But uh, so that's the best data we have. But, but um, observationally, pathologists know this. It's been, um, you know, it's been taking a lot of control from pathologists over this. Um, and basically, we've been advocating for a long time that it's sort of a, a major conflict of interest and that. You know, you, the, your pathologist should be able to make this diagnosis without worrying about any kind of financial incentive. 
I see. Can, so, can, can I yeah, can I ahead. give you I the uh, yeah. yeah? Can so um, one of the reasons why you know uh, I'm not saying this is necessarily defensible, but uh, in dermatology we talk a lot about clinical pathological correlation, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you being able to do that, you know, by a, a certain reaction pattern under the microscope um, might. Uh, portend one diagnosis versus the other based on clinical history. And if you have a relationship with, uh, you know, that dermatologist at your practice, or you are that dermatologist that also reads their slides, uh, you may be able to render a better diagnosis. Now, I'm not saying that this is um, uh, enough reason why we should self-refer, but that is a reason from a quality perspective. I see. That's a that's a justification for this policy, right? Correct. Well, and I think you're right that the that relationship is incredibly important, you know, um, and there's a lot of different ways you can get that relationship. But I think, and I think that was part of the reason, but, you know, every financial incentive will, if it's enough of an incentive, will produce these unexpected complications, right? And so now actually you have the reverse happening where these labs and practices are all consolidating. We briefly mentioned this in the paper yeah. under private equity firms, mm-hmm. right? Um, the good guys. are sort of the good guys. skirting around the corporate <laughs> practice of no, medicine. Yeah, yeah. It's about you know, efficiency, they're... Ben. It's about efficiency. That's right. That's right. That's right. The good and guys so it's and actually taking it away. You know, it's it's finding every loophole to where you technically headquarter the, the pathology lab, who technically owns all the practices, because again, there's corporate practice and medicine laws that they have to get around. And then, so all this combines to produce, you know, a behemoth of a multi-dermatology practice, a multi-pathology lab practice, or a consolidated pathology lab. And it can actually, you know, ironically take away that relationship. Then if you're, you know, at a major academic center and, you know, you just walk down to the pathology lab because it's in the same hospital. Right. Okay, so yeah. so let me see if I got this right. So I mean, it started with the original observation: incidence is up sixfold, mortality just a or just a stone cold flat line. And you look at the incidence up of lung cancer, and you look at the mortality of lung cancer, and then you guys show that tobacco explains lung cancer. It just explains it all. I mean, when you put those curves in that figure, I forget what figure is like two A or something like that. It's just a beautiful figure. Like tobacco and fifty percent people smoking explains lung cancer. And then you put UV which radiation, which people agree with, which people agree with, which people. Yeah. The only, the one thing we will all agree, there's no, no one will disagree. Tobacco smoking, not so good for lung cancer, not so good for lung cancer. Um, uh, then you do the same ex- exercise with UV radiation, giving the worst case scenario, which to be honest is maybe distorted. If anything, it's going to be upwardly yeah. distorted, right? Yeah, we don't even believe that that's true, but just to be honest, let's just do it, and it only explains a third. Ben comes in, and the the different points of argument Ben is making is, um, or that you all are making, um. Uh, one, um, more more biopsies, more diagnoses, and so you have this really elegant figure from Medicare data showing more. You 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 you, pit, you, you biopsy more, you're gonna find more, and it's like a linear relationship. What was that R squared like? Point nine nine or something? I mean, it's just like all the dots on the line. You're nodding your head. Okay. Then the next thing you're like is like um, more skin exams, more 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 uh, biopsies. I mean, you, you get more people in the door. Um, and then Ben makes the point that in the, you take the same slides from 19 diggity two and you. Look at them in 2022 um, or 2020, um, and uh, what they used to call benign nevi. Now you're calling melanoma, and and that was what it was like a 20 percentage point increase in the upcoding. Was it was that? Am I, is that my right, Ben? Am I right, Ade? Uh, yeah, it was a small study. But it's a small yeah, study. I mean, there's a small study, but but it does show uh, that. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and and then the added thing is, so why are they doing more biopsies? Um, and then there's this this potential financial. Well, it's not a potential. It is a financial conflict of interest because more biopsies, more money. And um, and then the thing I want to say is, um, you know, I, I've I've worked in academic medicine. This is my sixth year, um, and I've always wondered why people do what they do. Why is doctor so and so so eager to join, sign up for a certain shift? Why is doctor so and so willing to do um, bone marrow biopsies but not willing to do an LP or willing to tap an omaya but not willing to do this? Why is doctor so and so eager to work here but not there? Um, and every single time, I swear to God, every single time I probe those questions, why people are picking up this shift, not that shift, why they're doing this procedure, not that procedure, it's always – you know, it's always the money. I mean, I, I don't know. It's just maybe my bias, but it's always like people are 
people sniff out that, yeah, if I do a little more of this, it reimburses better per hour than this other thing. And and they do that. And that's not that's not bad people. That's just like we all chase incentives. And I actually think a really powerful incentive is if you make like one hundred and sixty two thousand dollars in year twenty eighteen. Um, and then there's some incent bonus structure to your salary, you're going to always want to make 163,000. You know, you always want to make more. And once you make 163, you'll never be satisfied with 162. Again, now you get 165, you know, that kind of thing. And that really, I think it's a really per- pernicious incentive. Um, and, and what you all are referring to is the fact that if you were running a very busy dermatology practice with this self-referral um, in combination with your dermatopathologist, um, you over time might see that uh, doing one little extra biopsy and, you know, God forbid, you know, we fault you for that. It's better to be prudent. Um, that might lead to a little bit more income. And you, you suspect that that is one of the sort of root drivers here. Is that fair to say? So I wouldn't completely throw my colleagues under the bus. Okay, good. I, I, you know, <laughs> all right. Um, and I do think that there's some altruism there in that uh, there's this idea that if you find ca- cancer early, that you're saving a life. I mean, I can think of on social media, there's actually a dermatologist that um, uh, posts a, a photo of themselves next to how many melanomas that they've diagnosed per month, right? Whoa. Um yeah. The leaderboard. Um, the leaderboard. Right. Like a leaderboard. Right. Yeah. Insane. We have that for Strava and for like Peloton. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah Insane. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I think that they they believe they've saved the life. Right. They believe they that uh, they do. they're they're doing good. And you pair that with, you know, the financial incentive of, you know, biopsying more. Then it's like, well, wh- why not? You just got to, you know, do so just in case. So you've, you've heard I, me call that. I call it the methamphetamine of being a doctor. The, the pairing the two is like the most addictive substance on earth. You really believe you're doing good and you get a little bit of bonus payment. That's methamphetamine. That's so addictive. Yeah. You know, and and so I, I think that because of that methamphetamine, you know, you have more biopsies happen, yeah. you know, over over time. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and, 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 and so then let's go to the, let's, let's get to the thing that I thought was really the, really the part that trigger warning and provoke people is the, the recommendations at the end. You all say, this is going to blow everyone's mind. But um, one of the current recommended screening is that people undergo a yearly skin examination. I, I don't know the exact details, but I suspect if they're fair-skinned, uh, there's more of a push for it. Um, but but these days, people want, uh, in the spirit of equity, to get everyone in for that skin examination. But you all say that it is time um, to suspend the annual skin exam. Um, you want to talk about that a day? Yeah, yes, of course. That's gonna. Be, that's what. That's what I've gotten a lot of pushback um, uh, on uh, social media for. Uh, less so on on Twitter than uh, on on Facebook. Actually, oh, interesting. Um, I lo- I logged back on the Facebook just to see what people were going to talk about this. You know, what they're going to say about this article, and uh, they they feel as though getting rid of you know seeing people on an annual basis um, will you know cost lives. Um, you know, but there's actually never been a trial to show that, you know, skin exams save any lives. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I'll die, I'll die on that hill. We can, you, I'll talk to you about that forever. Uh Um, but, um, you know, in particular, one of like, one of the, uh, um, uh, kind of public health campaigns that the American Academy of Dermatology is engaged in the, the spot me campaign, Mm -hmm. you know, we suggested that they should suspend it. Yes. Right. And yes. that's probably the most controversial thing that we said in, in the article, um, because um, it may be leading to more overdiagnosis and we should and it should be restructured to be, you know, maybe about education, about, you know, I know there's, you know, there's a lot of debate whether, you know, more awareness is oh, also right, a bad, right, also a right, bad, also right, a bad thing, right. you know. I mean, but, I think um, I think you, you, you guys argue it um, exceptionally well in the article, I think, I mean, which is that... Um, the USPSTF labels this service as um, we don't have any information about because we don't have yeah. prospective randomized trials testing the strategy against the conventional of not doing it. But you guys, you all go further and say, we do have information. We have in- information that the incidence has gone up sixfold in the absence of any exogenous risk factor that could potentially explain it. And mortality has not budged one iota, which is enough information to know you better suspend this practice. You think it's a net deleterious. You're nodding your head. Yeah. And I think that if we want to be serious about showing there's a benefit, do the damn trial. Oh. Right. 
That's um, why I love you so much. Yeah. You're right. And, you know, that there's not an appetite there. Um, you know, and often it's, they say, well, it's just too expensive. You know, it's going to take all these millions of dollars and all these years and all these people and all this stuff. And I'll say two things to that. One is if it takes that long with that many people, that much money to show a benefit, then is it worthwhile at all? Exactly. That's number one. And number two, if it's that expensive to do this trial, you know, I would argue that what we're doing right now is even more may right. Maybe, you know, more than that. And so, you know, we'll, we'll see if, you know, my, my hope in the future is to be part of, you know, designing a trial like that probably won't happen, but, uh, you know, I can dream. It seems like to me, um, boy, our conversation has hit so many universal themes that are prevalent these days. Um, I'll just I'll just shout out a few and we can and see if you guys want to spitball on any of them. Um, one theme is is that you all are writing an article that is an extremely thoughtful look at something that is an ingrained medical practice that happens day in and day out, and a lot of people are um, participatory participants in. You could even say complicit in. I mean, a lot of people are doing this. Okay. And you you all are saying, let's think more carefully um, about something we're doing and it potentially is not doing the good things that we think it's doing and it's potentially driven by sort of miscalibrated incentives. That's naturally going to rub people the wrong way. So some of the classic sort of rebuttals you've gotten is one, Ben Mazur, he's not an expert. He doesn't have the expertise to comment or, quali- or you know, to speak on this issue. And I guess these days I'm on Twitter and I, oh, that's, all, that's all it is, man. It's all it is. Anything you say, you're not an expert. You're not an expert. So first they say, you know, I said something. They're like, oh, you, you know, what the hell do you know? You're not a public health expert. And I was like, you know what? Look what I got in my, look what I got in my back pocket. I never, never used this. It's a, it's a degree in public health from Johns Hopkins. I pull that out. And then they say, oh, well, yeah, okay, but you don't have a PhD in epidemiology. I was like, but I'm a professor in the department of epi and then they're like oh you're not an id doctor obviously and this this is like this cult of expert i mean ben mazer he's a pathologist and ben how many fellowships have you done now two two fellowships three fellowships how many this is my first of two. First of uh, two right yeah. there you go I, I did a combined anatomic and clinical pathology uh, oh wait no i did one extra fellowship in med school sorry this is my second of three that's what i thought and uh that's what i thought yeah, yeah so and, 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 and for, yet it's been a long time and, and, and not yet, enough ben not enough ben not enough ben and and <laughs> And it's never enough because that's not really the argument. It's just that they don't like what you have to say, so they can obviously find that you know your clothes, you know, are, aren't the right clothes. Um, okay, so that was one criticism you got. The other criticism you got is the criticism that your view is dangerous. This is another criticism that's popular. It's a dangerous view. You're not just wrong. You're danger. You're dan- You're threat. Um, a day you, you don't you, you know I I'm not threatened by this view. I mean <laughs> I don't feel threatened by it. I mean I think. I mean, if anything, isn't the the art? I mean, isn't like your stance like um, if people heeded what you were saying, um, the aggregate benefit of society would be greater. You're trying to bring about good in the world. You're not trying to bring about evil. Yeah, and that, and also, there's a fair amount of you know, um, kind of patient like victim blaming that goes on. You know, I can't tell you how many you know patients that come in that'll um, you know because I have a pigmented lesion clinic, so I'm a metaloma yeah, expert, car carrying, all of that. Um, and you know, patients that, that their quality of life has suffered because they think that, uh, you know, a, a sunburn they had or them just not wearing enough sunscreen was a reason why they got melanoma. Now it's their fault. Right. Or their melanoma in situ, which may not even have been a, you know, true melanoma. Right. right? Um, and they completely altered their lives, you know, because of it. It's fascinating. And, and that to yeah. me is a harm. And it's a, of course it's a harm. Because being kissed by sunlight is a blessing. I mean, it's terrific. And we live in a society where that's increasingly stigmatized. I mean, I mean, everything is stigmatized now. I mean, especially in the times of COVID. But, but even going out in the sun and enjoying some sun is increasingly under stigma. Um, uh, it's so good for you. Um, and, 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 and having remorse that as a child, and a lot of these people, you know, they grew up in an era where it was routine to send the kids out to play for 18 hours. Um, and then they got sunburned. Of course they did. And the parents weren't too concerned about it. And now they have, you know, an AK on the nose. They've got, you know, um, maybe a, uh, you know, a half a millimeter melanoma or something like that. Um, it's nobody's fault. It's nothing you did. You just live life. And y- y- to be honest, it's probably not going to be what gets you in the end. Um, so I also what would want to say is that I'm not, and we make it clear, yeah. we're not advocating everyone go out and get sunburned like, whoa, okay, you know, right. Yes. right there, there, you know, there, there are benefits, not, I mean, sunburns are 
also uncomfortable, right? I agree. Um, yes. You know, but to think that 95% of melanomas are caused by the sun is just BS. It's not, yeah, pl it, not it, plausible. Yeah. Man. Not plausible. It, it may be worth, you know, some like myth busting here. Cause I, I don't think it's just, you know, we paint this picture and it's like, oh, these doctors are over treating. Maybe they have a financial bias. Pathologists don't know what they're doing. So they're, they're over calling things. And, there's elements of truth to all that, which we present in the paper, but I think um, I don't want people to come away thinking this is some like horror story, this terrible thing of every just everyone's messing up, you know, because people get that impression who don't understand the nuances of overdiagnosis and how complicated it is. Right. They get the idea that it's misdiagnosis, it's a mistake, it's evil, we're just selfish or greedy, um, you know. And it's, it's very hard to talk about the nuances of it because one, it's an extremely complicated topic. You know, I've been yeah. learning about this for the last five or six years and I'm still just scratching the surface. And, uh, you know, so like one thing people are saying, I, I've seen people say we're saying that, that, uh, UV radiation doesn't cause melanoma. You're not Which, in fact, that. we say the opposite. Right, yes. We say, it, it, we say it's one of the most consistent risk factors. Yes. The relative risk is two. Two. So your risk is doubled. That's yeah. not nothing. <laughs> like, yeah. you that's have to look nothing. at the prevalence and then, you know, that sort of thing uh, to take to find out sort of the absolute risk. But from just a risk factor point of view, there may be much larger. You know, the relative risk of smoking is like 20 for lung cancer. So it's there's much larger risks, but... Two is real. I mean, depending on what the thing is, if you said something doubled your chances, you know, so that when we add a quantification to something that doesn't dismiss it, you know, and then, and then another thing is people are saying, I, I'm saying pathologists are just misdiagnosing everything. They don't know what they're doing. The key here is that we're discussing gray zone lesions. We're right. discussing the most challenging pathologic diagnoses to make, uh, which are basically this differential between dysplastic nevi and melanoma in situ or early invasive melanoma. This is, um, this is not a clear distinction. And most pathologists, including dermatopathologists will tell you this. There have been large studies, multiple large studies of experts, including one that came out in the British medical journal a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, of which I know some of the experts who were involved and they're, they're world experts in melanoma. Not good enough, uh, but and, okay. and it showed that uh, they don't agree. Now see, it's a yes. so there's no gold standard. The gold standard was a panel, was the authors, you know, right. the panel of experts. Right. But it was all experts who were who were surveyed, and uh, they didn't agree with each other. Right. So you know, and I'm, we cite that paper, and people say we only cite this small study, but actually picking, we cite this cherry picking. That's we study huh? this rather definitive uh, BMJ yeah. study. Which shows at least they don't agree, and they can't all be right, right? So I mean, I guess um, let, I mean just to abstract. I think some of the cruxes of this issue is that I mean, what is the purpose of this entire um, endeavor? I mean, the purpose of the endeavor, I think, is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, we want to look at people who have things that are problematic on their skin, so we can intervene when it's small before it gets horrendous, and we have to intervene in a way that we have to cut them apart really big and painfully, so we want to get it earlier, so to prevent them the local morbidity of whatever it is. And we also want to intervene in a way so that, God forbid, whatever this tiny fraction it is that this is going to spread and have distant metastases and all that, we thwart that. Those are the two goals, and those are really good goals. And I can imagine if you were a doctor taking care of, and I've been there, you know, metastatic melanoma patients, God, you, you know, I mean, it's just like anytime something bad happens to anyone you know, you, you play that clock back in your mind so many times. What could I have done differently? What could I have done differently? That's just like this thing human beings are good at doing. And so doctors were along, and they saw these bad cases of metastatic melanoma. Um, they saw these, like, and I've seen some dis people who didn't get it taken care of. And, you know, you were talking about disfiguring facial, facial surgery and then cleaning it up with radiation and who knows what that's going to do, right? You know, the data for radiating, you know, melanoma in bed. Um, and it can be ter terrible, non-healing wounds and things like that. So that's what we all wanted to stop. And then all of these things come along the way. We think we're doing it. We're finding it. We have these big programs. We're finding a lot of it. The incidence is going up. We, t we come up with reasons why that ought to be the case. And, you know, UV explains a third of it. But, you know, we haven't really thought about that, that we're not really explaining it all. Um, so it is really well-intentioned. But the gold standard 
is not of like the gold standard of what is the pathology specimen. It's not what a bunch of pathologists think it's melanoma or not. The gold standard in my mind would be that you know that that lesion is the lesion that will someday be the bad one and not the lesion that will someday not be the bad one. And that is not something in histopathology. It's not something that's known by gene genomics to this date. We don't know what the gold standard is. And a day's point, I think that's incredibly astute, is when you're in these situations, the, the real best thing human beings can do is the randomized study to ask, is the act that we're doing, the ritual we perform, improving health outcomes for people. Um, that's, the, that's the best we can do to approximate it while we try to figure out whatever proteomic or genomic signature it is that port that can differentiate the bad ones from the, the bystanders. Um, what do you think of that? And the that? other important yeah. thing okay. is we're not just talking about, when we say that maybe this is a net harm or uh, you know does more harm than good, people also seem to think we're implying that it does no good, uh, which is not true what we're saying okay uh right it, does the early treatment of melanoma prevent metastasis prevent morbidity save lives i think almost certainly there are some people where that is the case uh where had you let that melanoma progress it would have gotten larger it would have metastasized it would have killed this person and by taking it out early even maybe taking it out in the in situ stage the melanoma in situ stage uh you've just saved that person's life are there individuals out there where that happens? I th I think absolutely. Now, let's say, how do you prove that? Yeah, how do you prove That's that? the really challenging part because you can't roll back the clock on yeah. an individual. Yeah. And then the other issue with melanoma in particular is pretty much to biopsy is to remove it. You, you try to get yeah. most of the lesion out so you can get a good diagnosis. So you've pretty much removed it just to get the diagnosis. But I, which I'll is tell you that, I'll push back a little bit because uh, I think that the, 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 the trouble with that explanation that there are some people that you're actually, you know, quote unquote saving their life is that the, the, in, the age adjusted incidence over time before Ipinevo is just stone cold flat. And so, I mean, you, you can assume that let's just say, you know, more and more people are getting UV radiation and the incidence is truly rising. You'd have to assume that the lives you're saving is like occurring at the exact same tempo as the real rate of incident rise. You know what I mean? Like if it were the case- Exactly. Yeah, no, okay, yeah. There's, there's no way that every early melanoma we are finding is translating into fewer advanced melanomas. Okay, so we have we the data that. to show that, That's right? That's right, true. Um, you know, but, we but mentioned I, briefly I say there's no then, way that even one in a thousand is, because if even one in a thousand is, there'd be some decrement in the mortality curve. Would there not be in those years? There there probably would be, although you have to remember, and again, yeah, you know, I, know. I, I really try to talk to doctors about this who aren't too familiar with it, because we're all like in the club where uh, <laughs> we're completely like, you know, when 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 we say over diagnosis, like we know what that yeah, word means, right, like true. that already takes yeah. us well past a lot of even physicians, let alone the public, right. you know, because if you talk to a lot of people, they'll say that one in a thousand is enough mm -hmm. that one, you know, right. And I can't say it's not one. I can't say it's not one in 10,000, one in 5,000. I mean, that's, that's not the kind of thing you can tell from epidemiologic data. Now you can tell that from a randomized trial. Mm -hmm. That's really our best shot at playing out these alternative, these alternative actions and, and to try to get an idea of what could happen in an individual, because that's the argument people will tell you that, well, you don't know what would happen to this person. You know, sure, right. my friend, my, my loved one had a small melanoma removed and, and they're alive and well a few years later. Right. And they're yeah. alive and well a few years later. And the dermatologist and, found it and it wasn't something they came in for. Right? That's right. Oh uh, yeah. Right, 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 right. right. And, and you know, and even if you get very understanding people who, who are smart to look at the side, they say, you're absolutely right. It's quite possible that was overdiagnosed, but if I had to be in the position I'm in now, right, where I had this removed and I got overdiagnosed, you know, I don't have some terrible scar. My life is going on. Uh, You're grateful. You're going to be grateful. Yeah, I'll take I'll take my chances. Of course. Now they don't see the other downsides, right? Not everyone has a good outcome, right? Uh, and then, you know, not everyone is bet has a benefit. Um, so. What? But it's you can't blame people for having that perspective in of their course, own. Of course not. No, I I can completely lives. understand why someone feels as if their life is saved a day. Well, I was going to say, it's what one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Terry Barrett, used to say. This is a uh, Nevo melanocytic industrial complex where, <laughs> where, where every actor feels like they're, you know, benefiting. The patient feels like they've uh, been cured right. of cancer. The dermatologist feels like they've found cancer right. and treated it and cured it. The dermatopathologist feels great because they've diagnosed a melanoma and potentially saved somebody. And then, you know, some of those actors get a little money in their pocket. 
right as well now i'm not saying that that drives it but no. what i'm saying is that everything is positive that entire yes. loop is positive Feedback right on, yeah Right, exactly, and 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 the the person that doesn't necessarily benefit is uh, the patient, at least on a population level. Right, right. I think Ben is right yes. that you can't, and that's the, that's you why never know the counterfactual for an individual. You never know, yeah, you, never you know, know. Yeah. and this is why this is such an amazing problem to discuss and think about and study, right. but also why it's frustrating to communicate because I I can't tell my patient that you know I diagnosed with a melanoma in situ that. If we left it there, nothing would have happened. Right. I can't. Right. Right. And um, then, I mean, I guess the problem you're, I mean, let's just talk about stenting stable coronary disease. You got the patient who said they had angina and then they got the stent and they feel better, even though, you know, Orbita suggests that they would have felt better if they had the placebo stent too. Um, you got the doctor who put the stent in, the patient comes in, says, I feel better, doc. And they saw that angiogram and you could see that that clogged pipe is wide open. They feel better. And the doctor got a little bit of money and the company got a little bit of money and the doctor goes to some dinner on Thursday night and talks about how great it is. And all these doctors talk about how they can slide that guide wire through this little thing and that. And I don't know what they talk about, but I can imagine that, you know, everyone feels good about themselves. Everyone, everyone is happy. Um, but then the question is, of course, did the intervention actually make them feel better and did it actually improve their rate of subsequent MI? You want to say something today? Yeah, I'm not saying, but, you know, but then it's hard, right? Because everybody yeah. feels good, right? Um, and You're then the buzz, it's hard. We're, we're the, the all three of us are the buzz kills. Yes, it's, it's the buzz kill. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, it's just it's it's hard. And and I and you know, I'm sympathetic to this idea that we like. I want to provide benefit too. Right. Like I I think that you know I, my diagnosis that I make, the screenings that I do for high risk patients in particular, like is providing a benefit. You know, but I also need to be honest that we actually don't really know. Right. Now, I want. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, to. I think I have the advantage if you're talking about like being a party pooper or buzzkill. <laughs> I am a pathologist, <laughs> which is perhaps the most like, you know, I mean, we see the absolute worst of uh -huh, everything. Uh -huh. a and uh, so I think, you know, look, I think the data speaks for itself. And I think we pre presented a very compelling right. data driven argument. Uh, exactly. Um, but you do have doctors or people too, and we have our personal experiences. And, you know, so I'm a, I'm a general surgical pathologist. I'm not a dermatopathologist. I do a little skin, but hard, challenging melanocytic lesions. You know, I send those to the dermatopathologist. Right? Why? Just call them melanoma. Um, you can't go wrong, my friend. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so I, uh, yeah, the more people you show it to, the more likely it's going to end up to yeah. be typical then. But, um, yeah. So finish your thought. Yeah, sorry. Go on. Yeah, so it's true. What was my thought? So it's I'm true sorry. that I'm not the subspecialist, but as a general surgical with I just telling Ade about this, like I I see the whole thing. You know, if someone stays in the healthcare system, I see every biopsy they get, every resection, every cancer, every other illness, cardiac problem, you know, non malignant I see. medical yes. problem. You see the competing risks. Go on. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah. So I see this all the time. I mean, and the thing is, you know, age, right, is the greatest risk factor besides smoking maybe, but, mm -hmm. you know, for cancer. And so we see these older people and they get two, three, four malignancies mm -hmm. back to back, you know, not, not even necessarily screened. I mean, even symptomatic, but sometimes screened. And uh, so I, I really do see the competing risk. One, I see when there's a medical harm, when there's some kind of unforeseen complication from the procedure or treatment, mm -hmm. even if it was absolutely 100% the appropriate standard of care, sure. everyone gave it to the highest sure. level, sure. there are complications. Sure. Uh, I see when someone gets screened for one cancer and then they develop an advanced cancer the next time. I see someone who has an advanced cancer and for some reason is still undergoing screening, you know, routine screening for prostate or skin or right. whatever. Right. And then they get some early, you know, they get some localized prostate cancer diagnosis yeah. when they already have a metastatic tumor of oh, something else. Oh, that's, so that's, I, that's a JAMA I, I 2009 see the whole spectrum paper. That's the 2009 paper where they go, the rate of screening for other cancers when you have stage four, another cancer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that happens a lot. Yes, and it does. So, yes, um, yes, yes. Um, yeah, so... Wait, go on, finish your I, thought. I, really I want to ask you a question. I see the whole, whole on, spectrum of things. And, uh, and, so and, and you're saying that, that gives you the perspective here. Yeah, there's just, I mean, absolutely unexpected things. Things that like people are getting the standard of care screening at the appropriate age, their their life expectancy is long. I mean, you know, nothing, everybody is doing the appropriate thing. And then someone has some surprise cardiac problem event. They have some surprise yes. secondary malignancy. Yes. 
Uh, and it turns out yeah. their life expectancy was not w- what you thought it was. So, yeah. and they're often it's very morbid. Yeah, but it's like to it's harm just. My, I go to work every day, and I I see the whole spectrum of bad things that can happen to people. And, okay, uh, let me, let me ask you this. I mean, I, I, your point is well taken with me, which is that the more cognizant you are that we are more than one disease, you realize that there are all these trade offs, and you can medicalize one thing to death while all these other systems are failing. And you know, the classic is that people with limited life expectancy get cancer screening, and they get like, you know, lumpectomy when they have an EF of twenty percent, or you know, when they have really other they're bad, on dialysis. They're on dialysis, yeah, they have other medical problems that are going to claim their life. Um, but it's difficult to stop that. It's very difficult to communicate to somebody. It, it feels as if you're um, giving up on them. But of course, you're not giving up on them. You're trying to cherish what time they have and and direct it towards what people really want to do, which is not to be a cog in the medical industrial complex. I think is a day so nicely put. But here's a question I want to ask you with it because it's I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I want to leave with this question. Um, and I really want to know the answer. So I really do want to know the answer. Um, you know, I was just thinking about it. Um, I, have a, I was talking to a friend of mine, and I was just thinking, like, this type of research, this entire line of inquiry, I think a day you asked on Twitter quite openly, is this going to help your career? Um, but I think um, – uh, and, 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 and I, think it, I think it's a real, really quite an important question. Uh, you know, this was a colleague of mine was saying that, like, if your goal in life was to be chairman of medicine, like, all you do is he's like, never write a commentary. You never do that. Never say anybody's work is bad. Never criti- Never even comment about their work, except to say, congratulations on the new paper, congratulations on the post, congratulations, congratulations, congratulations. Just Twitter, congratulations. And here's my new original article. You just do original articles. My new original article, new original article, and it can be in any journal. And then you go to staff meetings. You never make a fuss. You take extra shifts. You're a little flexible. You keep your head down, and you are destined. You have no liabilities. You can get there. You can be section chief and chairman and blah, blah, blah. Um, the path you both are on, and I'm on it too. God damn it. I'm on it too. The path you're on is a path that's different. You say things that people get angry about. And in that course of their anger, they say things back to you that you don't have the expertise that's required. You are ill-motivated and you want bad things to happen to them. They think twice before they'll ever make you section chief or chair. Um, uh, I mean, I, I think that it is not, I guess it's not the path of least resistance. So I guess my real question is, what the hell is wrong with us? I mean, or what is it? Is it, are, are we, are, are we illogical? Are we making a bad choice? Are we, are we, are we drawn to this like the moth to the flame? Are we, are we really trying to make the world a better place? Is that really our motivation? Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I've been doing a lot of soul searching. I find you know. IRBs very frustrating. And so if you do this kind of research, you don't have to deal with IRBs generally. Well, so I agree with you. I've, I, but I, but meta, any meta research, you could just do meta analysis. You avoid IRB. Yeah. Any, any, any secondary data analysis, we don't use primary study data. Okay. A day. What, 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 tell me. You, and this is not the only issue you've picked on. You've also picked on another, you know, the sunscreen and dark-skinned individuals. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I've gotten flag about that yeah. too. Um, you know, and then I also called out a uh, a, a uh, former faculty member at Penn who was done, who was, had done some, you know, um, uh, unethical research on uh, um, prisoners, and you know, never repented about it. Really, I and, didn't even you know, know that. that. Okay, yeah, that's not. Yeah, good. and that's you know, good. Uh, that's a great article. You okay, I'll go look and, that up. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, I. I was told by people before I put that out yeah. that, uh, you know, I should wait a few years till I'm more senior or that, you know, it looks like I'll be somebody that could be a leader in the field. So, you know, why, you jeopardize know, uh, jeopardize that all of this kind of stuff. And, you know, quite honestly, like I, I didn't take a pay cut uh, and, uh, you know, uh, to to like just do, you know, um, things that aren't exciting, right? Things that aren't pushing the envelope, pushing the field forward, right? Um, as an academic dermatologist, you know, um, you know, I mean, it's, again, it's not all about the money, you know, um, but, um, but uh, you don't make necessarily as much as you do in private practice, but you have the freedom to think. You got a freedom to uh, like, you know, um, basically just have fun, um, like pushing, you know, ideas around, challenging the status quo. Um, and uh, I think that there's a benefit to that. Uh, and and I also think that uh, by doing that, you can also, you know, make your field much better than it currently is. And, you know, I think, you know, Vinay, you talk about this all the time uh, in oncology and, you know, all the money that's, um, you know, swirling around and uh, somebody needs to say something, yeah. you know, 
Uh, there's some positions that I just I don't uh, that I have, but I don't necessarily. I'm not as courageous as you are uh, sometimes, or stupid, what, whichever <laughs> stupid one is you the are. Right word. <laughs> right? Yeah, um, yeah. I have I have limits, but you know, there's certain fundamental things like this that, uh, to me, I mean, this is a no brainer. This needs to be talked about. Do, does the criticism take a toll? You're talking about. You look on Facebook, and all these people can say mean things about you. Does it take a toll? Um, it does. It makes me worry, you know, sometimes about, uh, you know, cause I have to rely on grants. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and our people on the section is gonna, you know, say, Oh, there goes the day again, yeah. you know, trying to, you know, take down the field or trying to, you know, stick it to, you know, Durham or something like that. But no, it's, I'm, I'm trying to actually figure a question out. And, uh, you know, I like the freedom of that in, in, in academics. Although I think sometimes also in academics, your ideas, can also threaten some people, you know, as well. And I'm starting to learn that, um, you know, in early on in my, you know, faculty career. I want to hear more in a second. But Ben, what about you? What's the, um, where did it all go wrong with you, Ben Mazur? Yeah, you know, um, well, I I was a nuchal cord at birth, and so I probably <laughs> lost a lot of oxygen, um, you know. But bes besides that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not exactly a, a researcher and I'm not exactly an academic or a scientist. Um, you know, I, I went to business school before I went to medical school and, and there is a part of me that gets very frustrated about things. And there's like an activist part of me that says like, we really need to change this. And, and I get angry and you can tell which tweets those are. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but a bigger part of me is, you know, I've always been a reader and a writer and, so much of the process of writing is just trying to understand how things work and trying to understand how you feel about them, how, how your experiences brought you to something. And so, so much of what I try to do in medicine is just to understand things. You know, um, someone tweeted about the article that we were trying to like question the reality of melanoma. And it's like, I don't understand what that means. Like we're presenting data. Like I'm just trying <laughs> to figure out what the reality is. I don't, you know, how are you so sure what the reality is? You're like, and, you're like working honestly, on the big bang. You're trying to figure out reality, man. <laughs> <laughs> Questioning the reality. And so, yeah, question, you know, wow. th honestly, the only reason I put recommendations in things I write at the end is because every time I used to write something where I'd give this really heartfelt journey, uh -huh. I went on to try and to no understand recommendations. something. The editor would always yeah. be like, you didn't recommend how to fix this problem. <laughs> I know, they always like, say that. You just they described this that. huge, important problem, and you didn't say how to fix it. And I was like, have you met me? What do I know how to fix any of these things? Yeah. And so then I like, okay, second draft. I had a paragraph at the end. And then the criticism is always like, I'm not sure your solution is going to fix this problem. And it's like, I don't think so either. But, you know, the editor made me. So I'd be more than happy to just say, like, let's just, like, look at these problems and, you know, at the end, of course, if you see these big problems, you don't come up with a solution, you just mope about it, which I'd also be perfectly happy to do. But um, I guess so that's I, where I come from as a I writer, guess not I'm, a scientist. I'm, I'm, it's very I'm, different. I'm near all of you. I mean, I, I'm with the day on one thing, which is like, you know, it is a blessing to – I mean, we're doing this for a reason, which we're taking a pay cut. Uh, my, me too. On college and private practice, I'd be making right. more money. Um, and we're doing it for a reason. So I want like what I do to matter. Um, like I want it to matter, and I want it to try to make the field better. Um, and, um, I mean, there are lots of ways you can do that too. I mean, I could be pipetting, trying to find some cure or whatever. Um, the other thing is like, I'm trying to use whatever b b b talents I think, I mean, I think I'm, my brain works well at some things and it's terrible at other things. I know so many things in life I'm awful at, no good at, no, no talent and talentless hack at, and I try not to do them. You know, you don't, you don't see me doing them too much. Cause I like, I know I have like nothing to contribute. I have like suck at that. Um, but I think like I'm trying so I try to find that space where I can contribute something, try to make a difference. And then I guess the other thing I have to admit is I'm drawn to this space because I'm drawn to rational people saying irrational things. I'm drawn to it. I don't know why. It's like a compulsion. Um, like, like these are smart people you're interacting with. They're super smart. They're dermatologists. For Christ's sakes, you got to be so damn smart to be a dermatologist. Um, you got to be smart to be there. I mean, they're doctors. They went to really good schools. They're really smart. And in many things in life, they're hyper rational, super thoughtful people. And sometimes like a, a medis like a my multiple myeloma doctor, if you teach him about like colon cancer and you show them the trials you explain it to them and you say would you use this new drug they'd be like well, what well you haven't proven to me that it improves survival or quality of life or you know they're very rational then you go back to their disease where they live and breathe and then they're irrational again um and so i'm drawn to that because 
I, I mean, and, and this is a great year for it <laughs> because I think people are people are saying some things that are irrational to me. Um, and 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 somebody once said to me like, you're more critical of people who you're more closely aligned with than people who you are like really you know on the other side of the political spectrum or like really think apart from you. And I was like, yeah, I am more critical of the people I'm closely aligned with because I'm like. That's like my that's like my tribe, um, and like a day you're not like because you're critical of of dermatology like you're not critical of dermatology but like you want to make dermatology better because because you're a goddamn dermatologist and you want it to be a noble profession. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I care about dermatology and dermatology. I'm not right. I'm not trying to like destroy the field. I'm just trying to make us you know more honest about certain you know fundamental things that don't make sense. They and you know sense, you, you yeah. like you you show them the data. You're like look, look, like. This makes sense, right? Like, you know, and it's insane. Like, just like you're saying, like the people that are just so smart, so rational, but, you know, you challenge them on UV exposure and, you know, melanoma and they're like, head explodes. Like, this doesn't make any sense. I'm like, what? You get like a 280 on your, on your board. <laughs> know, you, know, yeah. like, you got, you got AOA, 280 you know? reasons to understand <laughs> this, my <laughs> friend. 280 <Right>. reasons. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, you're like, you know, by all uh, metrics, no. you're like, you're you're like a genius, <laughs> but like, don't you see the curves? Doesn't yeah. make you know? Okay, last question so. for you: Is it fair to say that all three of us have heard Gil Welsh give a lecture? I know a day you have. You've invited him, right? Yeah, yeah, many many times. Many times, and and Ben, you've invited him to give a lecture. He uh, he went to one of the big pathology meetings and gave a talk on overdiagnosis, and that uh, I could not get the time off to go to it. He emailed me. He was like, we have to meet up. I was like, no, you don't understand. I'm in residency. I, I don't have time to go. <laughs> oh, so I missed the pathology over diagnosis talk by, uh, I, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I've seen lectures he's given online. Online. I mean, he's, uh, he's a fabulous speaker. Uh, that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. So I guess, um, you know, I had him out to Oregon before I left and he gave a lecture. And afterwards, like a student who worked with me a long time, I, you know, I, I told all the students I work with, you know, our trainees, I'm like, you got to come check this guy out. Let's see what he has to say. Um, and um, afterwards, somebody came to me and he was like, um, he was like, yeah, that was the best lecture. And I was like, yeah, it was good, right? And he was like, yeah, no, it was like the best lecture I've ever been to in any format ever. And I was like, what? Excuse me? And I was like, but it was, it was. And uh, and then um, it it I mean I mean I've been influenced by his work uh, you know obviously like like both of like both of you have been and 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 the work of other people who work in this space um, but the lecture changed me in, in a deep way um, it made me realize a few things which was you know every time you get a chance to speak in front of other people it's a real opportunity to try to um, educate them excite them engage them um, and and keep them interested. And and you got to do all those things. And I think the reason his lectures are really good is he he distills to an essence what he wants you to know. It was like two or three. It wasn't a lot of teaching points. It was like two or three teaching points. Um, he hit it over and over again. Every slide, the animations, the video. I mean, this guy splicing video to like I don't know if you've seen that Good Morning America bit he does. Um, you know, he put a lot of effort in. I mean, he put it like a Japanese sushi chef. He spent four days cutting this fish just right before you could eat. I mean, he put a lot of effort in. Um, he cared about the audience. He he didn't take it for granted. He wanted everyone's attention. He he worked he worked hard for that lecture. Um, and he wanted you to laugh. He wanted you to feel a little bit inspired, and he wanted to teach you something. And the moment I heard his lecture changed me forever because I was like, you, if you do anything less than – I mean, I, I'm not going to be as good as him, obviously, um, but I'm, I'm going to give it the same – I'm going to give it the same commitment because I think it's an honor. And so, um, you know, I just thought that that's worth talking about. So – and to, to add to that yeah. too because I've had the chance to work with him over the past couple of years is – he is just as thoughtful in that way as he is in writing a paper, mm -hmm. like sentence by sentence, um, like word by word. I know, you know, you know, Ben, you, you experienced that in writing this this paper, just even like the smallest little details. It's incredible how detail oriented uh, this man is. And he's changed how I, you know, even think about writing papers, presenting, mm -hmm. you know, my data. And like you, I'm hoping to be even somewhat as, um, you know, thoughtful and engaging as he is and, and, and really take it seriously, you know, teaching. It's, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to try to persuade somebody of your point of view. That's so well said. When, uh, when people ask me what it was like writing a paper with them, I said it's like, you know, his style is like country doctor academic. Like <laughs> he, he's, you know, incredibly data driven, uh, I think maybe even more than I am, but he recognizes that you know you need to convince 
everyone of this argument. You need to bring everyone into your conversation. Um, and especially, I think he knows he's making very controversial points sometimes. So he's especially aware that, you know, you need a little bit of sugar or whatever to make the medicine go down. And so he has this way of, of writing things and talking about things like he just sort of came across it or he just had this thought, you know, like, like you would, I imagine probably how he was with his patients, you know, you just, you got to talk to them and convince them and uh, you take that one step at a time and you don't judge them and you just present them the information and and then you base it on, you know, the kind of feedback you get. It's really, I think it's absolutely improved my writing. I mean, it's, it's really a remarkable way he writes and speaks. Yeah. And then, and lastly, I, I, I also would say that the fact that someone with his like, you know, um, ability to write, communicate, he's written multiple books, like every every year he's got like multiple New England Journal articles about stuff in his mm -hmm. in his wheelhouse. And he has not been able to fully convince, you know, um a broad swath of medicine. I feel like, you know, uh I don't know if I'll be able to <laughs> actually accomplish anything. But, you know, damn it, I'm gonna try. That's a very interesting point. You're right. Um I I think about his career and a few others like him, like, you know, back in the day, Peter Gocha and some of his early work and Barry Kramer and, and Bill Black from Darwin. Before he went off a cliff, yeah. we should be clear. Uh, I pre cliff. Pre cliff. <laughs> Um, um, but you know, the, uh, but Gocha's book on mammography is really sort of le legendary. Um, and, um, and, and, and a number of people I think about, um, in, in this space, um, I guess I, I, I think it's so interesting because, um, you know, a lot of the same things were that you both and I have experienced in the recent weeks, um, were levied at him. You're not an expert. You know, he's not a radiologist. You're not a mammography expert. Um, you're just an intern. You're just an internist. That's what they. That's how they'd say it. Um, you. Um, uh, uh, you're wrong. You want to kill people. I think that bo all these people. Um, you know, got a lot of those allegations. Um, it was in an era pre-social media, so it wouldn't get the pylon and the, the sort of the intensity of it. Um, um, but it was also a, an interesting time because, you know, I don't know. I feel like. I don't know. I, I sometimes think that, like, if if Gil Welsh were saying the stuff about mammography he said in like the 1990s, now Facebook would like label the posts like fake information. You know, like you you, you get like a hundred radiologists that say like this is gonna kill people. You better put that label on that. And um, I don't know, but I I mean I think it's interesting. It's a very interesting dynamic in medicine. You know, a field where. Re reforming ideas that are counter to the popular narrative. Many are wrong, of course. You know, Ben, you know, who's been messing me, sending me a lot of that are just clearly wrong. But a few are right, and it's really tough to kind of find them and, and encourage them and, and keep that alive. But anyway, this is that, that was a nonsensical comment. I don't know what I even said. Um, okay, I'll give you gentlemen the last word. Uh, we'll do Ben then a day. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for. Um, I, I, I tweeted and I wrote an email to about 200 people and I said that the paper is a work of genius. It's a work of genius. It's the best paper of the year 2021. It's a short year so far, but I think it'll be in my top 10 list <laughs> so at the far, end. So far, 2021. But it's, it's a work we'll of genius. It's, it's, a, it's a work of genius. Um, and, um, uh, I, and people have to read it. There's no substitute. Even this, even this legendarily good podcast is no substitute for reading the paper. All right. So Ben, a day. I'll give you the last words. Thanks for joining. Ben. Uh, you know, I'll say one thing I'll reiterate. I think, I think there are a large subset of people that can be convinced by the data. And, and if you talk them through the data, they can understand it. They might say, well, why, you know, isn't UV the cause? And you can show them the curves and you can show them the lack of decrease in, you know, thick melanomas and, uh, the lack of decrease in mortality and all these things. And there's that subset. And then there's people that are going to get very scared and upset and uh, angry and just have the whole spectrum of emotions from frankly, apathy to, mm -hmm. to extreme, extreme, extreme anger. Mm -hmm. And I think the way to respond to these things is with empathy because I've experienced all these emotions about different medical things completely. You know, if you, if you take me out of this context and you put me into a different context, like I'm going to be pissed off about something, some dumb medical thing, someone's saying that's going to get people killed. How could you say that? Mm -hmm. And I may or may not be right about that. Who knows? So I think, I think these are all very human emotions. 
And, and when you meet people with those emotions, I think that's how you sort of diffuse the situation. You know, I, I don't, that's why I really don't like the idea of talking about evil doctors or selfish doctors or greedy doctors. All these incentives can be there, but uh, I really think if we just took time to like have that human connection, we would probably change a lot more minds about this. It's not just about the data. A day. And yeah, and what I would say is that, um, you know, especially for, you know, dermatologists or people that uh, are really an advocates for screening everyone, um, is that I, I want the exact same thing that they do. I don't want people to, you know, get metastatic melanoma and die. That's not, that's, you know, I, I didn't become a doctor to wish that upon anybody. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that uh, we need to be thoughtful about the limited resources that we use, you know, um, to keep, you know, people in the population healthy. Um, and I think that, you know, I'm going to try to do as good a job as I can to convince, you know, my tribe that overdiagnosis is an issue. To me, it's a open and shut case at this point. Mm -hmm. And what we should really be discussing is what, if anything, we should be doing about it. Is that less screening? Is that you're doing a randomized control trial is that you know what whatever you know it is and that's where we need to be spending our energy because um our patients you know deserve you know that kind of a dialogue yeah thank you both for joining it's a pleasure to have you on appreciate it thanks you've been listening to season three of plenary session plenary session is produced by kiana klosner music by ian straley and audrey tran the views expressed on Plenary Session are those of whoever said it and no one else. Plenary Session is not medical advice. Follow us on Twitter at plenary underscore session. Until next time.